Shabbat Shalom, you all. You know, this parable of the tares that we've been <clears throat> looking at for the last couple of weeks already is packed full of spiritual gems. Last Sabbath we went over how the soon coming Antichrist is the chief tear. He's the terror of all tares, no, no doubt about that. And very sadly, he's going to be accepted by most people in the world, including a lot of Christians, because they are ignorant of what the facts are, what the truth is, or they are just deceived. His deception, the Antichrist deception, is going to be very, very thorough and very absolute. You know, Yahshua was not afraid to publicly object to the doctrines of Judaism in order to expose their errors, and in order to explore, expose the false teachers, the false teaching that was going on during that time period. He was very outspoken in his language. Here's some of the terms that he used to describe those false teachers, blind guides, wolves in sheep's clothing, whitewashed tombs, brood of vipers, <laughs> quite descriptive, are they not? You know, our generation has really moved away from that zealous, active terminology that Yeshua and the apostles used. You know, nowadays, people are afraid they're going to offend someone. Oh, we are not to judge anyone. We don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Time and again, Yeshua confronted those leaders in Judaism over their man-made traditions and their false ideas that were based on their oral law. At that time, it was called the oral law. Why do you think the Apostle Peter, in the book of Acts, refused to eat with the Gentile believers. Remember when uh, he and the Apostle Paul were with some Gentile believers and there were also some Jewish believers and, and Peter refused to eat with the Gentile believers. He separated himself until the Apostle Paul confronted him in front of everyone. Why do you think that he did that? Why was the entire religion, using that terminology, of Judaism so racist? There's a website <clears throat> that's called My Jewish Learning, and this is what they say about that time period. Among the Jews then, back then, there was a sense of Jewish distinctiveness and the need to maintain an independent Jewish ethnic and religious identity. The creation of such an identity was only possible if boundaries existed between Jews and non-Jews. Now that was the way that they looked at things, evidently. But hence, what was called the Oral Law, or the Mishnah, and is now in a written form, with its multitude of sometimes conflicting rules and edicts from many rabbis prior to Yeshua came into being. Those rabbis did so with the intention to create a fence around Yahweh's law. But by doing so, they made up their own version of the law. They had add-ons, you know, that their edicts and their little oral law precepts and principles regarding just the Sabbath day. They had well over 100 separate things that you could or could not do on the Sabbath day. And even nowadays, that's what those many Jews in Judaism go by. They will not even go over to a light switch and turn on the light. Kind of surprising, isn't it? But you know, Yahweh's law, his Torah, never even implies any sort of racism. Does not even imply that. 
Now, Yahweh's people are to refrain from any contracts or joint ventures with those who do not believe in Yahweh, but nowhere does the Torah say that Yahweh's people are to cross on the other side of the street in order to avoid them or to refuse to eat with them or anything like that. Now, we're talking about non-believers. Those are all man-made traditions. However, because the oral law back at that time specified those many opinions of avoiding pagans, the Pharisees very vigorously enforced them. Everyone in Israel was brought up in that religion. That's why Peter was as he was. That was called, we would call it nowadays, baggage, would we not? And think how long that baggage hung on to Peter. <laughs> A long time. The Jews of Yeshua's time thought that racism was valid, and it was widespread throughout Israel. The vision that Peter had with that sheet coming down out of heaven with the various animals on it was proof that racism was not Yahweh's doing. It didn't have anything to do with food. He was showing that there's no difference between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, believers in Yahshua. Now think back, as last week's sermon we were talking a little bit about, or quite a bit about, Germany and Hitler and Nazism and so on. Now think about the, the churches in Germany. Okay? Why didn't those German churches hold the line against anti-Semitism? Why didn't they hold the line against Hitler and Nazism. That's what you and I are supposed to do as believers in Yeshua. Can we really think at the judgment seat of Yeshua that Yeshua is just going to say to someone that's been racist all their life, well, I'm glad that you thought the Jews ran the world. That's okay. Yeah, it's okay. I'm glad you thought that way. Even though I'm the king of the Jews, now this, you know, Yeshua would be talking, and I'm, I'm just... I'm just throwing this out, okay? Yeshua is the king of the Jews. It's okay you're anti-Semitic. Yeah, it's okay. I think your attitude's okay. Now, you think that's the way it's going to be at the judgment seat? No way, Jose. Absolutely not. Yeshua's judgment is going to come down on all people who are anti-Semitic in this lifetime unless they repent. Last Sabbath... I showed you that 95% of those Protestant pastors in Germany, 95% took the oath to Nazism. Has any of you ever looked at the oath? I just looked at it for the first time when I was preparing this message. Here's what it says. Here's what they said. They had to say this and do the Nazi salute when they were doing it. I swear by, I'm not even going to read that. Okay, you can read it for yourself. That's terrible. It's wicked. And they're doing it to, or they did it to Adolf Hitler, as you see by the last two words that are there. That means that those pastors, 95% of those pastors in Germany did this. And millions and millions and millions of church members did that. You know, unless those people repented, that sin is unforgiven. And they will be judged according to their works at the judgment seat of Yeshua. Everyone that has an anti-Semitic attitude is going to have that. Racism in any form is nothing but pride with the idea, well, I am superior to that person, or I am superior to that race. Anti-Semitism is darkness. Light and dark do not mix. We are to be a light in the darkness. The Germany of Hitler's day was 95% Christian, including 55% Protestant. That was of the population, 55% were Protestant, 40% were Roman Catholic. Today, nowadays in Germany, the overall percentage of Germans that belong to either one of those denominations is less than 50%, about 48%. That's about a 50% drop since World War II. 
it's very probable that the widespread anti-Semitism among those claiming to be Christians had a very unforeseen effect. Their evangelism went away. Their fervor for Yeshua went away. Their impact upon their children and the grandchildren and great-grandchildren went down the drain because of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism does not promote the kingdom of Yahweh. Anti-Semitism is a doctrine of the tares. Satan has planted the tear of anti-Semitism in the flock of Yahweh, and it is a worldwide sin. And it's growing, unfortunately. It's growing, sadly. And as with any unconfessed sin, anti-Semitism will prohibit one from receiving eternal life from Yahshua. It has no place in the assembly, and it certainly will have no place in the kingdom. All right, now we're looking at tares, looking at the parable of the tares. <clears throat> we're going to go to the book of Proverbs. Gary just finished reading Proverbs chapter 10, and we're going to start, though, and look a little bit in chapter 7 and 8 and 9 today. It's also called the Book of Wisdom. King Solomon wrote most of the Proverbs that are in it. Starting out in chapter 7, verse 1, My son, keep my words and store up my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live. Now let's just pause there for a moment. It's not talking about necessarily having physical life at this time. There are a lot of people that have kept the commandments and within a very short time they were brutally murdered or some accident would happen or something of that nature and they would lose their life. This is talking about eternal life. We're going to look at a correlation with some other scriptures that prove that in just a little while. But going on, keep my commandments and live in my Torah as the apple of your eye. Tie them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your kinsmen, so that they, the commandments, they may keep you from the promiscuous woman, from the stranger who flatters with her words. You know, this entire chapter talks about an adulterous woman. Chapter 7 talks about an adulterous woman that targets the souls of men. Now, that's the surface meaning of the chapter. There's nothing wrong with the surface meaning of the chapter. It's talking about physical adultery and how a man can stay away from it and what a promiscuous woman will do to try to seduce a man. But you know, there's a lot deeper lesson to it than just that. Okay, we're going to look at the deeper lesson. First of all, many times in Scripture, when it talks here in chapter 7 about an adulterous woman, many times in Scripture when the, the word woman is utilized, and this may sound sexist, but it's just the way Yahweh uses it. A woman represents, in Scripture many times, a woman represents either good doctrine or bad doctrine, either false doctrine or good doctrine from Yahweh. One or the other can be either one. Here's one example in the book of Zechariah. Then the angel who was speaking with me came forward and told me, look up and see what this is that is approaching. So I asked, well, what is it? And he responded, it is a measuring basket that is approaching. And he continued, this is their iniquity in all the land. Then a lead cover was lifted, and there was a woman sitting inside the basket. This is wickedness, referring to the woman, he said. And he shoved her down into the basket and pushed the lead weight over its opening. Now, we're not going into the, all the meaning with that prophecy. That's a prophecy for the latter days. We are living in the latter days. But I just wanted to show you how this is one example of woman being referred in this particular case, referring to wickedness or bad doctrine but a woman can also refer to good doctrine. What is the assembly? Okay, we are the assembly, but the assembly is always referred to in the feminine gender. 
is it not? Why? Because we are the bride of Yeshua. You get the correlation there. We are the bride. Yes, men, you are part of the bride. And that may be hard to wrap your brain around, but facts are facts. All right, so going back now to chapter 7 in Proverbs, I'm not going to read this again, but this is emphasizing the very singular idea of obeying the commandments, particularly the seventh commandment. We must keep the commandments. We must keep specifically the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, and we should not commit spiritual adultery. That's the deeper meaning that's behind this chapter. You know, when you and I ask Yahweh to reveal his scripture to us, it's a privilege we all have, folks. But we have to put aside any preconceived notions of scripture. You know, go back to that example of Peter. When Peter had that sheet that came down in that vision, and the animals and the insects, evidently, they were on it. And he heard the voice that said, eat, arise and eat. And he said, oh, no, no way. I can't do that. I've never eaten anything unclean. And he never had. And, of course, again, the, the point of that was not to eat food. The point was for him to realize that there is no race of people on the earth that are below another race. We are all on a level playing field. There's no one that we are to be looking down our noses at and saying, well, I'm better than they are. We are all sinners saved by grace, if we are indeed saved. So when we ask Yahweh to reveal his scripture to us, he will take us deeper into scripture. You have that privilege yourself. I have that privilege. The man and woman that are described in this chapter are not, it's not just talking about physical, physical adultery, it's talking about spiritual adultery, and that's what we're going to focus on today. You know, Yahweh likens Israel's rejection of him to committing adultery. He calls it adultery. To reject Yahshua or any of his words is spiritual adultery. Many places in Scripture, Yahweh states, my people have committed adultery against me. And he's talking about spiritual adultery. Look what it says in the book of James, chapter 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with Yahweh? So whoever may want to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of Yahweh. You know, any time a true member of Yahweh's assembly, a true member now, compromises and yokes himself up with the world, he becomes an adulterer or an adulteress. When a member, member of the body of Yeshua yokes himself up with some group that says they are Christian but they are lawless, then they are becoming an adulterer or an adulteress. This is a critical thing for you and I. We are to not touch the unclean thing. The unclean are those that are the lawless. When I say touch, I'm not necessarily talking about touching with your hand. We are not to yoke up with them. Look what it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Apostle Paul says, But now I have written to you, not to associate with anyone who is called a brother, if he be either sexually immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one you are not even to eat. That's pretty strict. That is pretty strict. That's not because we are better than anyone. It's because we are light and they are darkness. And we are not to associate with them because we will be defaming his name, Yahweh's name, by doing so. Do you think these are just words of suggestion? Do you think that these are just words of advice? 
No. You and I will be judged by these words right here. These are just as important as any of the Ten Commandments. We need to remember that. Please pay attention to what we're saying here. Much of Yahweh's congregation worldwide today is committing adultery against him. Proverbs chapter 7 talked about the adulterous woman. Proverbs chapter 8 talks about the virtuous woman. That would be a woman that is in obedience to the commandments. And is living a life of confessing sin when sin is done. You know, no one's perfect. We cannot say, oh, I perfectly obey the commandments. That would be baloney. <laughs> no one can do that. But thank Yahweh for 1 John 1, 9, which says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just. Forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when we do sin, confess it and get right back on track. So Proverbs chapter 8 is dedicated to the virtuous woman. This virtuous woman promotes righteousness and truth. And the opposite of that is in chapter 7, the lawless woman. The lawless woman speaks lies, and she sows tares. And she represents a tear, T-A-R-E. So these two chapters are linked. Yahweh has brought those two women who are opposites side by side, chapter 7, chapter 8 in Proverbs. And it's important that we understand that. And in chapter 9, look what he says here in the very first verse. Wisdom has built her house, and she has carved out her seven pillars. Now, this word wisdom here, when you think about how in the world can wisdom build a house, well, this is a personification. This is a personification of Yahshua. How do we know that? Well, we have to go to the book of 1 Corinthians, where the Apostle Paul received a revelation about this. Look what he says here. But to the called out ones, both to Jews and to Greeks, Messiah is the power of Elohim and the wisdom of Elohim. So he says that Yeshua, the Messiah, is wisdom. Yeshua, the Messiah, is the power of Yahweh. So when it says back, as you see at the top of the screen, wisdom has built her house, is talking about Yahshua building his assembly. He's building, he's been in the process of building his assembly for right at 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years. Think how close we are to that exact year coming up, the celebration of 2,000. Yet, yet the first glance you say that this concept of uh, attributing a, the female gender to Yahweh or Yahshua, it's a little confusing. Well, y Yahweh will use, and he has used many times in Scripture, he has used this personification or using the female gender sometimes to show us what his character is like. For example, look in Matthew chapter 23, where Yahshua said this, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one killing the prophets and stoning those sent to her. How oft I desire to gather your children in the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. Can't you just hear Yeshua in a plaintive way crying that out? Well, he didn't say, as a rooster gathers her chicks, his chicks. He says, as a hen gathers her chicks. There's many other examples in Scripture. But the point is that Yahweh uses this wording technique in Proverbs chapter 7, 8, and 9. Look again what it says, in, starting in verse 1. We've read that already, and then going on to verse 2. She, talking about wisdom, she has prepared her meat, she has mixed her wine, she has furnished her table. You know, he's talking here about Yeshua building his assembly. 
Don't you and I want to be a part of his assembly? Now, we're not just talking about a local assembly. Here we are, a local assembly. But I want to be a member, a true member of his heavenly assembly. I want that eternal life. I don't have that eternal life yet. There's no one that's living on this earth that has that eternal life at this point. It is awarded to those that endure to the end. We have to endure to the end, keeping the commandments to the end of our life. If we slip up and stop obeying the commandments, then we will not receive eternal life. We may go in the kingdom, yeah, we may be there, but not with eternal life. That's something we're thinking about, is it not? You know, Yahweh uses parables, allegories, and symbols throughout Scripture. You think about in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, 2, and 3, where you had the seven candlesticks, the gold candlesticks. Why is it seven? It says he holds the stars, the seven stars in his hand. And then he wrote the letters in chapters 2 and 3 to the seven assemblies. So he's talking about, and those, by the way, each, each one of those letters is to a, a different facet of his assemblies that are in existence at this very moment in time. Every one of those is in existence at this very moment in time. We know that we are living in the last days, a Laodicean age, and that Laodicean attitude is rampant throughout the world. But you know, there is also an assembly of Sardis and of Philadelphia and Ephesus and so on. And it's an individual thing. It's an individual thing. All right, so verse 2 here, she has prepared her meat, she has mixed her wine, she has also furnished her table. This correlates with another parable, actually, that Yeshua gave in Matthew chapter 22. Look what it says here. Yeshua speaking, the kingdom of heaven, see these are called kingdom parables. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent out his slaves to summon those invited to the banquet, but they didn't want to come. Again, he sent out other slaves and said, well, tell those who are invited, look, I prepared my dinner, my oxen and fattened cattle have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention. Went away, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the other seized his slaves and treated them outrageously and killed them. The king was enraged, so he sent out his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned down their city. Then he told his slaves, the banquet's ready. But those who are invited were not worthy. Therefore, go to the, where the roads exit the city and invite everyone you find to the banquet. So those slaves went out on the roads and gathered everyone they found, both evil and good. And the wedding banquet was filled with guests. Now, what is that banquet? What does it represent? That banquet represents the wedding supper of the land. The invitation that's given represents the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the, the good news. Isn't it wonderful good news of the kingdom? It's absolutely so. That's not the gospel that's being preached today for the most part. We'll get into that in just a moment. The king sent out the invitation but those guests that he had originally talked to, they refused. They had some pretty sorry excuses for doing so. But you know, there's a twofold prophecy here. First, those invited guests represent Yahshua's own kindred tribe, the Jews, the tribe of Judah. They refused him. As we know, they refuse to proclaim him as Messiah. You know, there's a second prophetic aspect of this. It re represents those of today who say that they accept Yeshua, 
but they refuse his commandments. They beg off and they offer excuses, saying, well, those words only apply to the Jews. That's a very typical excuse that we hear. And so in this parable, it said that the king had slaughtered cattle to prepare his dinner table. Just like it said back in Proverbs chapter 9, wisdom has prepared her table. She's mixed her wine. She's invited those to come. And again, notice it speaks in the feminine gender back in, in uh, Proverbs chapter 9. It says, she sent out her young women. She cries at the highest places of the city. Whoever simple, let him turn in here. As for the one who lacks understanding, she says to him, well, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I've mixed. Forsake the foolish and go in the way of understanding. Now, it says that in the very top there that she sent out her young women. Well, we know that Yahshua sent out his disciples. You and I have been sent out. You and I have that same mandate. You don't have to be one of the 12 apostles. You don't have to be one of the 120 original disciples. That is a command given to you and I to give out the gospel of the kingdom. It's not Daryl Prindle's sole responsibility here. It's each one of ours responsibility to give out the gospel of the kingdom. Yahweh gives us opportunities to do so. It's up to us to take that, these opportunities, and give out that gospel. We're to tell people that Yahweh gave his only begotten son and if they confess him with their mouth and believe in their heart that Yahweh gave, raised him from the dead, they will receive eternal life. However, there are two Gospels going out today. We give out the Kingdom Gospel right here. That is the sole goal that I have in my life, to give out the Gospel of the Kingdom. I want to make sure that gets out accurately. But you know, the other gospel that's going out is one that is partial. It's truth mixed with error. One was sown by the good man, Yeshua, the kingdom gospel. And the other one has been sown by Satan. Here's a breakdown of each one. Look at that phrase at the very top. To believe in Yahshua. Remember it says, believe in Yahshua and you will have eternal life. Well, in the first century, the definition there, as you see in the left-hand side, it was spread by the, every one of the apostles, including the Apostle Paul. It was faith and obedience that results in eternal life. That hasn't changed. It's faith and obedience it's called the gospel of the kingdom. And it's the only gospel that Yahweh the Father has authorized. There is no other gospel. But as you see on the right-hand column, starting in the second century all the way through the present time, 2,000 years almost, it was started out to be spread by the man called Marcion. A few weeks ago, I went into how uh, uh, Andy Stanley, son of Charles Stanley, Baptist Bible teacher that was on TV for many, many years, pastoring, I think, in Memphis and so on. And Andy Stanley said, it's time for us to unhook our wagons from the Old Testament. Well, that wasn't original with him. Now, the terminology wagon being unhooked might have been original, but the idea of despising the Old Testament or not using the Old Testament, the Torah, there's nothing new about that. Marcion was the one that started that. And what they have done, look what it says in that faith alone. I used to be a part of a church and they would trumpet that. Faith alone, faith alone. It's faith and obedience, folks. You cannot have eternal life without obedience along with the faith. And faith alone will reject 
result in someone's being rejected from receiving eternal life and from ruling and reigning with Yahshua. That's called the gospel of grace. It is a tear gospel fabricated by Satan. Read and beware. The kingdom gospel is an invitation to come to the wedding supper of the Lamb. I want to conclude that temp that parable that we just looked at, the, the wedding banquet parable, because it's quite important for this what we're where we are at in this juncture of the study. Remember that those that were originally invited by the king refused, and the king went to other people. Going on, here's what he says, Yeshua says. And the king coming in, talk about now at the banquet itself. And the king coming in to look over those reclining, he saw a man there not having been addressed in a wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here not having a wedding garment? But he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Binding his hands and his, or his feet in his hands, take him away and throw him into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, few are chosen. Now, of course, we realize this is a parable. We don't base our doctrine on a parable. Yahshua gave an explanation on this, though. But it's clear that the man did not have wedding clothing on. What is that? He did not have on the robe of righteousness. You and I are to put on a robe of righteousness. We receive a robe of righteousness when we are converted. We are to maintain the purity of that robe of righteousness without spot, without wrinkle, like it says in the book of Ephesians chapter 5. It is your responsibility, my responsibility for each one of us to maintain that robe of righteousness to be white. Now, obviously not literally the color white. We're talking about something that's spiritual. It's not tangible. But we are to be without spot and without wrinkle. And notice that Yahshua said in the very last sentence there, for many are called, few are chosen. That is not some kind of concept of predestination for those of you that I have ever heard of that. It's not predestination. It's simply talking about those that obey the call are few. Those that are called, it's a worldwide call. Think about the hundreds of millions of people in this world that claim to be saved. Hundreds of millions. I'm not exaggerating with that. In fact, according to statistics, there are right at 2 billion people in this world that claim to be Christian. They're all called. How many are chosen? It's only those that obey. It's a remnant. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 7. I can get to it here. Okay, here's the verse that I missed. I, I apologize for that. You can see it. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide. The road is broad that leads to destruction. There are many who go through it. But, how, but narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to the life, and few find it. Let's talk about the millennial kingdom. Eternal life and ruling and reigning with Yahshua. You know, People nowadays have been told that as long as they trust Jesus, they'll be okay. Just trust Jesus. It's faith alone. Just trust in Jesus. You'll be okay. Well, when it comes to the marriage supper of the Lamb, those that have not been in obedience are going to experience a very sorrowful, discouraging thing. If anyone does not have the wedding garment representing their righteous actions, then they have a false hope. All right, back in chapter 9 now of Proverbs. 
says, Come eat of my bread and drink of the wine I've mixed. Forsake foolishness and live and go in the way of understanding. Well, first thing was that, you know, back in verse uh, 2, I believe it was in 3, the invitation was given, come eat of the, my, my table. I've, I've, uh, I've prepared the table. I've mixed the wine. And there's an invitation. There's a message that's behind that invitation. According to Yahshua here, wisdom, remember, he's wisdom. Yahshua is wisdom. He's the wisdom of Yahweh. And he's the one in chapter 9 that's doing the preparation. He's the one that's building his assembly. So to forsake foolishness literally means to stop walking in lawlessness. It's foolish to be lawless. It's wise to obey the law. To obey the holy commandments. And if you do so, you will have eternal life if you are obviously following Yeshua also. And you will be allowed to go to the marriage supper. You know, where it says, and live here, where I'm putting my arrow there with my cursor, forsake foolishness and live. Again, it's not talking about physical life. It's talking about eternal life. Look what he says in Leviticus chapter 18. You shall keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live. I am Yahweh. Now, it's not again. It's not talking about physical life on this earth at this moment in time. We're already living. It's talking about eternal life. To forsake foolishness and live is to obey the commandments and have eternal life. And Yahshua was even more explicit with a young man that came to him and asked, what do I have to do to get eternal life? And Yeshua said in the highlighted area, if you desire to enter into the life, keep the commandments. Pretty simple. Pretty simple. So, this lady in chapter 9 of Proverbs, the virtuous woman, she's the one that is behind the gospel. And she says to repent, keep the Torah, keep the commandments. But the other woman in chapter 7, the foolish woman, the adulterous woman, look what it says here referring to her even in chapter 9. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knows nothing. You know, that word clamorous, I looked it up. It means boisterous, loud, unruly. And again, we're not talking necessarily about, yeah, we are, there's a physical application here, no question. But we're talking about adultery, spiritual adultery. That's the deeper meaning of this. She's simple and knows nothing. What does that mean? She knows nothing. Well, here's the definition. My people, Yahweh says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, the knowledge, I also rejected you from serving as my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your Elohim, I will forget your sons, even I. You know that most Bible teachers think that that highlighted verse there in Hosea chapter 4 is talking about Bible knowledge. Well, there's nothing wrong with Bible knowledge, but it's, that's not what it's referring to. It's referring to the relationship that you and I have with Yahweh. That's the knowledge we sang a song during our singing time of obeying the Sabbath. Perhaps you remember one of those phrases that says, that I may know him and learn his gracious ways. We keep the commandments in order to know him, to know Yahweh, to know Yahshua, to learn his gracious ways. That's what knowledge is here that he's talking about. It's a close relationship that Yahweh wants with you and hopefully you want with Him. Look what it says in Proverbs chapter 1. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and reproof. You know, the millennial kingdom, Yahweh plans for you and I to be priests and kings. Well, if you look at that verse there in Hosea, he says, I rejected you from serving as my priest. 
if we are not keeping the commandments, we won't be ruling with him. It's as simple as that. You and I are to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. We want, Yahweh wants, as many people as possible to be ruling and reigning with him. That's our responsibility to proclaim the good news for that reason. That's good news. To rule and reign with Yahshua, to receive eternal life. What can be better than that? The foolish woman that talks about at the top of the screen there, she knows nothing. She does not possess the law. She's forgotten it. You know, at one point in time in the first century, the entire assembly of Yahweh, the entire congregation possessed and obeyed the law. Now, it's just a sprinkling here and there. Just very rare that you find an assembly that wants to obey the commandments. The foolish woman is adulterous. She represents mainstream Christianity today. The tares have been sown. The falling away that the Apostle Paul talked about has been occurring for many centuries. Perhaps it's going to increase, but it's been going on for a long, long time. And soon, Yahweh's angels will separate the wheat from the tares, and the end result is not going to be a nice one to experience for anyone, but it will be just. And Yahshua closes this parable out in chapter 13. Then as the tares are gathered and are consumed in the fire, so it will be in the completion of this age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who practice lawlessness, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine out like the sun in the kingdom of their father. The one having ears to hear, let him hear. And I pray that your ears are perked up and that your heart is listening. You know, we see these wonderful truths, these spiritual truths th throughout the entire word of Yahweh. We just need the spiritual ears to hear them the spiritual eyes to see them, do we not? So be a Berean. Until next Sabbath, Shabbat Shalom to each one of you.